I would like to begin by acknowledging whose land it is upon which we meet tonight. For thousands of years before colonial times, the members of indigenous communities traveled from far and wide to gather at the meeting of the three rivers, the Ottawa, the Gatineau and the Rideau, from the Chaudier to the mouth of the Gatineau River. This area is rich in natural resources, plants, animals and fish, and also provided a convenient meeting place for trade and communication among communities. Of special significance are the burial place at Hull Landing at Chaudier Falls, a sacred place for meeting and sharing and ceremonies. The burial grounds in the Ottawa Gatineau corridor, including Hull Landing, were important for rituals of respect and bonding with the landscape. Victoria Island, located under the Portage Bridge, continues to provide the sacred space to local and visiting Indigenous people. The National Capital Region, which includes the City of Ottawa, remains unceded Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. We encourage our members and guests to reflect on this, our connected history, and ways we can contribute to the reconciliation. Next, we would like to extend great thanks to the City of Ottawa, the province of Ontario, and to our membership. Not, if not for your continued support, none of what we do would be possible. My name is Ben Weiss, and welcome to our February virtual HSO Speaker Series presentation, presented in partnership tonight with Black History Ottawa. We are partnering tonight in recognition of two landmark anniversaries in 2023, the 230th anniversary of the 1793 Act to Limit Slavery in Upper Canada, and the 190th anniversary of the 1833 Act to Abolish Slavery in the British Empire. 2023 also marks a landmark anniversary for the historical society itself, 125 years since our founding in 1898. We've been telling Ottawa's great stories throughout those 125 years, including now through our twice monthly speaker series. As you know, we currently run two separate parallel speaker series. In-person presentations are held in the Ottawa Public Library Auditorium on the second Wednesday of each month. In addition, we bring our virtual presentations into the comfort of your home via the Zoom on last, the last evening of each month as we are tonight. The next time we gather at the Ottawa Library Main Branch Auditorium in two weeks, attendees will be treated to a double feature. At one o'clock, we welcome Phil Rossi, who will provide us with a behind the scenes perspective on the history of a legendary service organization, the Kiwanis Club of Ottawa. Then at two o'clock, we are welcoming Sam LaPrade, host of the daily Sam LaPrade show on City News Radio 101.1 and 1310 AM. Now, many of you know, I appear on Sam's show every week, Tuesdays just before noon, and I chat with Sam about Ottawa's history for 10 minutes or so. But now we're turning the tables and Sam LaPrade is coming to do a presentation for us. You see, March will mark the three-year anniversary when COVID-19 arrived and the whole world came to a sudden stop. When that happened, Sam was handed the responsibility of hosting the City News daily COVID update show. And Sam took this responsibility to heart, hosting the show 87 of the first 90 days of this pandemic, providing the COVID update virtually seven days a week during those crucial first three months. If you remember those first 90 days, they were terrifying and bewildering for all of us. We were scared for ourselves and even more so for our loved ones. No one, including the authorities, could tell us exactly how dangerous this would be. And no one knew exactly what we should do. We didn't know whether we should wear masks and we were scrubbing our groceries when we got them home. People were dying, hospitals were overflowing, and we were told to lock ourselves in our home. When Sam LaPrade joins us in two weeks, she will recall those harrowing first few months of this deadly pandemic from her unique perspective as special host of City News Ottawa's daily COVID-19 update, connecting with and reassuring her listeners daily as we all desperately sought to come to grips with this devastating and frightening new health crisis. Sam LaPrade will be here at the auditorium telling that story three weeks to the month when it all began on Wednesday, March 8th. Our double feature begins at 1 p.m. Our next Zoom presentation, four weeks from tonight, will touch on a much earlier health emergency that also had sparked great fear and took far too many lives. We will be welcoming the author of an extraordinary new book, Bytown 1847, Elizabeth Briere and the Irish Famine Refugees. 
Michael McBain will delve into the heart-wrenching tragedy of the Irish potato famine and the appalling conditions experienced by the Irish refugees on their voyage across the Atlantic and down the St. Lawrence. The inspiring courage, compassion, and faith demonstrated by the French Canadian nuns for the desperate Irish upon their arrival to Bytown, the immense divisions that existed in Bytown at the time, and how this crisis came to unite and heal many of those great divides. So that will be Bytown 1847 with Michael McBain at 7 p.m. on Zoom on Wednesday, March 22nd, four weeks from tonight. For those who enjoyed tonight's presentation, may also be inspired to register for our three-part Saturday morning book club workshop series beginning this Saturday, based on the critically acclaimed book, Island on Fire, again, a project in which we've been honored to be a partner with Black History Ottawa. Last I checked, there were still one or two spaces available. So if you go to our website right after tonight's presentation, you should be able to uh, join us. All of the details are right there, as well as the link to pre-register. For the outstanding lineup of activities and other resources for Black History Month, visit the Black History Ottawa website. Which brings us to this evening's partner presentation. A reminder to everyone to kindly keep your settings on mute so as not to interfere with our speaker's presentation. And actually turning off your video feed once we get going assists with the overall transmission as well. Tonight's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. So during the presentation, please start typing your great questions into the chat box. I will be passing things off to June Gervin in a moment, who will provide some context for tonight's presentation, and will introduce her co-presenter, Glenn Sweezy. We again welcome June Gervin, President of Black History Ottawa. If you have a chance sometime, visit our website and click on the recorded version of the phenomenal presentation June did for us last February, We Are the Children. You will be moved and inspired by this presentation. June is a remarkable woman. She's received so many awards, including the Order of Ontario, the Ottawa City Builder, and the Martin Luther King Dream Keepers Award. June came to Canada from Jamaica over six decades ago, when we were only allowing women of African descent into the country because some of our rich families were having trouble finding nannies for their children. June came to Canada, but she sure didn't spend much time as a domestic servant. In this strange new, very white country, June decided she had to be a strong role model for her children. So she went to university. June was eventually the first black woman to attain the office of vice principal in an Ottawa school. The first black woman to be appointed to the Ontario Ministry of Education as a regional education supervisory officer. June Gervin has devoted her life to nurturing, protecting, affirming, and giving voice to children and vulnerable youth and newly arrived Canadians. She has committed a lifetime as an educator, activist, and community leader. June formed Ottawa's Janikira Dick Dickinish Education Center, named for her children, which serves children, youth, and immigrant families through unique programs that foster intercultural understanding, racial harmony, and social justice. Among June's many philanthropic efforts is the June Gervin Bursary awarded annually to a Carleton University graduate student researching a topic related to reconciliation. There's more, but if I go on, there won't be time for tonight's presentation. So let me hand things over to June. And a reminder once more to everyone, please stay on mute and please begin typing in those great questions. Wow, <laughs> thank you, Ben. Um, what can I say about Ben? Um, I'll just write the book, <laughs> just write the book. Thank you so much, Ben. I have the pleasure of introducing um, Glenn Sweezy. Uh, who will give tonight's presentation, tonight's talk. Glenn is a retired English teacher, high school English teacher. He lives in Ottawa. His writing often blends poetry and prose to paint narrative canvases. He's got a story to tell. It's a story of what the North Star means for us in Canada. He's taken time out from his very packed community engagements, uh, teaching English to newcomers. And right now, particularly newcom newcomers from the Ukraine. 
so Ben has thrown himself completely into this story, uh, just as any teacher would. The story that he's going to tell us tonight is a story of what the North Star means for us in Canada, as I said. It is a story about the power of the human voice, the power of the voice to inspire, and the power of the voice to change the world. It is a classic human story of call and response. It is a story of good overcoming evil. It is a story of our human potential for cruelty or for splendor. As Gandalf said to Frodo in J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, all you have to do is to decide what to do with the time given. Ben's story will tell us how persons back 230 years ago decided to do what to do with their time given. As I said, Ben is a poet and a writer. And uh, one of his poems, OK Booma, really sets up the stage, sets the stage for him to tell the story tonight. The poem begins, moonwalking. I'm dreaming of moonwalking, kind of like Michael Jackson, I guess. Not only so silky smooth, I'm shuffling backwards across the stage of time. So now I hand you over to Ben, to Glenn, who is going to take us back in the stage of time to tell us a story of Chloe Cooley. Good evening, everyone. Tonight's presentation is titled The End of Slavery in Upper Canada. First, I'd like to thank the Historical Society of Ottawa for the honor of inviting me to speak to you this evening as we mark the 230th anniversary of the Upper Canada Act to Limit Slavery during Black History Month. Next, I'd like to say that when I was first asked to do this talk, it surprised me somewhat because I'm not really an expert of history when it comes to early Upper Canada. However, however what I was experienced at during my professional working life, and even since retiring as a secondary school English teacher, was and still relates to storytelling. Working with words that have power to communicate meaning both implicitly and explicitly. This, this evening, I'll be sharing a history story with you. It's a story that explicitly includes the recorded historical facts, but also it's a story that will include untold and hidden parts of Upper Canada's history of slavery. So it'll be a story that includes some people who often have been left out of the history stories that are often shared in school classrooms. Finally, before I start my talk, I'd like to inform you that since this is a history story that relates to a time and place when terms and words that, that were used in early Upper Canada are different than what we use today. I apologize in advance if some of these words alarm, alarm you during my talk this evening. There'll be words like wench and Negro, for example. So to begin, I've titled my talk slightly different. I suppose it just adds an adjective. It's the title of my talk is The Gradual End of Slavery in Upper Canada. And I've subtitled it, Narrative Myths Believed as Historical Truths. This story has a preface. So I'd like to begin by reading something I read online. It isn't so much of what we read from now online. It's by Andrew Hunter, Hunter and it's titled Tainted Wealth, Canada Has Tried to Erase Its History of Slavery. And I quote from Andrew Hunter, one can imagine Sophia's name or at least the description of her existing elsewhere 
and one can imagine it in her various owner's business papers. It'd be anonymous, a number listed as chattel, like furniture, equipment, or livestock. Or she'd be described as a slave, a Negro, or with her true status hidden behind an apparently neutral term, like servant. When a child, Sophia would have been described as a girl. When a woman, she'd be called a wench. Sophia did not find freedom in the early 1800s at the terminus of the Underground Railroad. Sophia escaped from her owner in New York and then was sold to a property owner named Samuel Hatt, who paid $100 for her, and she lived with him for seven years in Dundas, Hamilton, before she eventually was free and lived in the Upper Canada Black Settlement of Queen's Bush. I, at the end of my talk, I'll, I'll um, give some of the references. That reference is from uh, found on the walrus.ca Canada-slavery from last year. So the history story, the gradual end of slavery in Upper Canada. First, the story has an introduction. The introduction is titled Narrative Myth-Making of History. The ongoing time-based narrative we call history has traditionally been thought of as a more or less unwaveringly straight linear story, a story based on facts. In school classrooms, for example, students of history learn about date facts, roles and impact of key historical figures, and of course, historical events that are seen as significant by chroniclers of history. More specific to Upper Canada during its earliest years, that is 1791 to the 1830s, and to the degree which slavery was a fact of early provincial life, classroom students of recent generations know well the stories of Upper Canada as a, quote, safe terminus, unquote, for escaped slaves from the South by way of the Underground Railroad. For example, versions of the heroic story of Harriet Chubman, or Tubman sorry, are well known by students today. However, they've been taught typically very little, if anything, about slavery that existed in this young British colonial province. For example, few students in history classrooms have been taught there were somewhere between 500 to 700 enslaved Black people in 1790s Upper Canada. And that's keeping in mind the colonial population at the time was only about 14,000. So much for early Canada, the righteous and good. Simply put, the notion of historical truth told from this view by history's chroniclers couldn't be further from truth. Rather, it can be seen as a form of narrative myth-making intended to forge familiar and acceptable identities of different communities, some of which were portrayed for future readers in a distinctly positive light, others with a negative perspective while still other communities have been given no voice at all. This evening, this evening, I hope not only to account for some of history's narrative regarding slavery and its end in Upper Canada, but to also give some voice to those in Upper Canada, Upper Canada's past, who were and often still are selectively forgotten. Now I'd like to pause just for a second because this term I'm using selectively forgotten will come up more than once during this talk. It's something that I've borrowed from uh, Nick Draper, the inaugural director, and Catherine Hall, the chair of the Center for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery. I quote, to counter, quote, selective forgetting, whereby society forgets the human cost of slavery, but celebrates its abolition. The myth building of history tends to, quote, selectively forget many who felt the cruelest burdens of Upper Canada slavery. People like Chloe Cooley, Peggy Pompadour, and her children, Amy, Millie, and her son, Jupiter, as well as another named Richard Pierpoint, a freed slave from the American colonies who lived for years in Upper Canada and fought with Butler's Rangers in the American Revolutionary War 
and again with the British in the War of 1812. Chapter one, slavery in Upper Canada, this history story's beginning. I'll start with some historical facts for background regarding times and places. After the end of the American Revolutionary War in 1783, United Empire Loyalists started coming north as an escape to Quebec, an immigration that began before Quebec was separated into Lower and Upper Canada in 1791. Britain passed the Imperial Statute of 1790, allowing, but in effect more accurately, encouraging United Empire Loyalists to bring north with them their property, including, quote, from the statute, quote, Negroes, household furniture, utensils of husbandry, or clothing, clothing duty-free, end quote. As such, slavery was imported with the United Empire Loyalists. The British colonial province of Upper Canada was established in 1791. This, this by separation of the large former province of Quebec into Lower Canada, a predominantly French-speaking Catholic population, and Upper Canada, a more British-like English-speaking Protestant population. Along with the Eastern provinces of New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, Upper Canada became a preferred destination for United Empire Loyalists. With the Constitutional Act of 1791, each of Upper Canada and Lower Canada became governed by a separate legislative assembly with a second upper chamber known as the Legislative Council. In 1791, John Graves Simcoe, a British Army general and politician known for his anti-slavery speeches in Britain's House of Commons, was named Upper Canada's first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. It's important to note that at this time, slavery was still legal in British colonies, such as Upper Canada. Equally important, in the early 1790s and for a number of years in the new province, members were chosen as governing representatives to sit on Upper Canada's Legislative Assembly, as well as on the Legislative Council. Members chosen for Upper Canada's early governments were British men of some wealth and standing, enabling them to take on such positions of power. Many of the men chosen to govern over the young colonial province, they and their families owned slaves. Chapter two, a loud shout no in Upper Canada's history story the long thorny path to slavery abolition. Looking at this PowerPoint slide and the one that will follow, this one titled Protagonists, Resistors for Ending Slavery in Upper Canada, 1790 to 1830, and the following slide, which will be Antagonists to end Ending Slavery in Upper Canada, 1790 to 1830, we see that yes, there were people at the time with considerable political might, as, as well as notable others, prepared to fight in an effort to bring an end to slavery in Upper Canada. I'd like to note in particular, the first three names that I hope you can see on the PowerPoint slide. John Graves Simcoe, who was Upper Canada's first Lieutenant Governor from 1792 to 1796. William Osgood, 1794 to seven, 1792 to 1794 was first Chief Justice, as well as sitting on the exec Executive Council for Simcoe, which would be like his cabinet, and John White, the first Attorney General, he, who wrote the bill um, that I'll be talking about soon, um, the, which is um, noted as and called often called the Act to Limit Slavery. Uh, he, that was uh, passed in 1793. These three were the main politicians in the government at the time, Upper Canada government, who were push, advocating for an end to slavery. James Monk, who was a Lower Canada Attorney General and King's Chief Bench, he made decisions regarding escaped slaves that um, prevented them from being returned to their owners. Um, and Ward Chapman, a lawyer, also advocated for slavery's end. 
going to the next slide, which is the um, uh, the the uh, should read it. Oh, oh, this is a continuation. Sorry, the um, that's okay. The this slide. Sorry, this slide ended up as being two slides. It was I thought it was one. Protagonists and resistors. These are some of the key people I'll be talking about later, um, who are people who really um, were the I'm going to the hidden people um, that we don't read about in history or hear about in history who were key to um, eventually ending slavery in Upper Canada. Chloe Cooley, of course, I'll be mentioning quite a bit about her. Peter Martin and William Grizzly, who I'll talk about them as well, having witnessed um, an event re um, related to Chloe Cooley, which many of you may be familiar with. I'll be going into detail. Um, Samuel Sharp, eventually, who was um, uh, a um, enslaved worker in Jamaica, who's um, who becomes key in ending slavery, both in Upper Canada and the British Empire. John Robinson, who's named, uh, you see there as well, was Attorney General in 1819, who declared that all Black residents of Upper Canada were set free and um, protected by Upper Canada's courts. Continuing on. Yet, we also see there were others of wealth and power determined to resist any change to Upper Canada status quo concerning owning Black slaves during the 1790s. So this is the antagonist standing slavery. We'll see the first name, um, Peter Russell. Peter Russell is important to note um, because he was receiver general uh, and a mem member of Simcoe's uh, legislative assembly. He was on the executive council, so he would have been in ca the cabinet of the day. And he was a speaker of the uh, legislative council, the upper chamber. So he was involved in all aspects of the government. And he was eventually in 1794 named to the king's bench as a Puisne judge. That would be a lower judge because he didn't have any legal training. Um, he was named, especially after William Osgood went to Lower Canada. And what's key to note, of course, is that. Uh, and it will come up in my talk is that Peter Russell was a slave owner. Robert Isaac Doug Day Gray, Solicitor General, another um, member of uh, the, uh, the government at the time and, and also a district court judge. He um, was a slave owner as well. Just a final note, in the Legislative Assembly, the members of 1793, Four of the original 16 members owned slaves. And in the Legislative Council, members in 1793, nine of the original 15 members owned slaves, which included um, James Babby and uh, Peter Russell amongst those names. It's interesting from a personal note, I lived for eight years in West, West End Toronto near the Humber River less than one block from Babby Point, which is named after James, James Babby. Christopher Robinson, another antagonist to ending slavery. The father actually of John Robinson, who was in the previous uh, slide as Attorney General in 1819, who um, announced that um, the, the uh, slaves would be free, quote unquote, in the eyes of the court at the time, even though legally they still were slaves. Um, his, the, John Robinson's father in 1798, Christopher Robinson, introduced a, belt, a bill to legislative assembly to in effect reverse the 1793 act to limit slavery and bring back the imperial statute of 1790. He did that after, um, this was well after um, Simcoe had returned to Britain. Continuing with the talk, from the beginning as Upper Canada's first Lieutenant Governor, John Grave Simcoe faced political challenges within his governing bodies, both the Legislative Assembly and Legislative Council to affect slavery abolition. There were, of course, antagonists to abolition of particular note, 
such as Peter Russell. However, efforts to effect slavery abolition by legislation in Upper Canada's earliest parliaments were stymied mostly by the sheer numbers of legislators who owned slaves. In storytelling, at least in works of fiction, a plot line unfolds that reveals the story's action and conflict by way of an event or initial act that creates a quote, a narrative spark, so to speak, for the storytelling's fire that's to follow. Here, by the way, I've chosen the spark and fire metaphor to foreshadow the story's concluding events. Upper Canada's political and cultural biases in the early 1790s created a stalemate for Simcoe and others wanting to end slavery in the young colonial province. Because of this stalemate, a spark and subsequent fire were badly needed if anything were to be accomplished politically concerning slavery in 1790s Upper Canada. That spark to incite, or at least to some degree, create a political fire for change regarding black slavery in Upper Canada came on March 14, 1793 in Queenston, a short distance from Newark, which was Upper Canada's capital at the time. On this day, a black slave named Chloe Cooley was violently bound and abducted and taken across the Niagara River by her owner, Adam Vrooman, and two others so she could be sold in the United States. Chloe Cooley shouted no to Upper Canada's rooftops in her struggle to be free. Chloe struggles and shouts were witnessed by two men, Peter Martin, a black slave owned by Colonel John Butler, and a white neighbor named William Grizzly. Starting with Chloe's brave resistance and with witness and testimony by Martin and Grizzly, a political fire was ignited in March 1793. Though simmering and dim in the beginning, it was a fire that would not be put out until slavery was eventually abolished in Upper Canada, more than three full decades later. On March 21st, 1793, the abduction of Chloe Cooley was brought before Simcoe's executive council. Though Vrooman had broken no British or Upper Canada statutes or laws, but acting as he did with Chloe, she was after all his legal property. Simcoe, Chief Justice William Osgood, and Attorney General John Wright were determined to push forward a bill that would abolish slavery in Upper Canada. Written for its most part by White, with help in drafting from Osgood, the first anti-slavery bill of its kind anywhere in the British Empire was presented during the second session of Upper Canada's first Legislative Assembly in Newark on June 19th, 1793. Simcoe's anti-slavery bill of 1793 was a much compromised piece of legislation. That was because of resistance from within his own Upper Canada Legislative Assembly by members who were slave owners and their allies. In July 1793, Upper Canada's governing body passed an, quote, an act to prevent the further introduction of slaves and to limit the terms of contracts for servitude within this province, AKA the act to limit slavery. The act clearly had limitations regarding slavery's end. Slave owners like Peter Russell, Robert Isaac de Grey, as well as other wealthy upper Canada colonialists would be allowed despite the legislation to keep their human property as slaves for years to come. But, Embers of a fire sparked by Chloe Cooley's shouts of no on March 14, 1793, would not be doused until Upper Canada slavery was brought to a dramatic end in the 1830s. Now I'm going to pause the story just for a bit to do a bit of an imaginative link to a Chloe Cooley story if things had been different. Chloe Cooley, like anyone, would have been, had ambitions and hopes for a life that wasn't a life of someone who was enslaved. There would be people that she loved and cared for, people that she would want to grow her life with. 
Adam Vrooman's actions on that day in March 1793 dashed those hopes and ambitions. They stole them away from her. And she was taken to a place that she did not know. So she was taken away from her home and the people she would have cared for. It's the story that remains hidden to us. And we will not know because Chloe had it stolen from her. And I wanted to add that because we read so much in the history books about the people like Peter Russell, the people that would have been involved in history that played a role, but she didn't get a chance to live that life. Chapter three, slavery in Upper Canada's new capital. In late August, 1793, Simcoe founded the town of York, the predecessor for the city of Toronto, which became the new capital of Upper Canada. A government building, law court and garrison were among buildings of the new town with original foundations laid with the help of slave labor. During, during the early years of the 1790s, there were 15 black slaves owned by families living in York, with 10 more on the outskirts of the town across the east, across and east to, of the Don River. Men living in York who owned slaves while sitting as members of Upper Canada's government during this time included Peter Russell, Robert Isaac de Grey, James Babby, among others. Familiar names of modern day Toronto streets and areas include names of slave owning families, such as the aforementioned Babby Point near the Humber River, as well as Russell Hill Road and Peter Street. Chapter four, Peggy Pompadour and the selectively forgotten of Upper Canada. By the time Simcoe left Upper Canada to return to England in 1796, William Osgood had already moved to Lower Canada in 17, that was in 1794 to be the Chief Justice there, which meant Upper Canada's Legislative Assembly and Legislative Council lacked anti-slavery voices in government. Due to the political challenge of sheer numbers resisting slavery abolition, Upper Canada was still many years away from ending slavery in the province. The violent incident involving Chloe Cooley in 1793 gives us an example of the treatment experienced by slaves at the hands of their owners in Upper Canada. Harsh treatment from slave owners could be made worse by threat of being sold as unwanted property similar to what had happened to Chloe. The experiences of another enslaved person at the time by a woman by the name of Peggy Pompadour and her three children, all who suffered under Peter Russell's ownership, provide us with another story of what life must have been like for the enslaved of Upper Canada. Now you see the slide there, but before I, I um, make a um, comment on that slide, I want to bring you um, some of what I was able to, to come up with on Peggy Pompadour's story. Although Peggy's husband, just named Pomp Pompadour, was a free man after serving in the British military during the American Revolution, Peggy and her three children, daughters Amy and Millie, and son Jupiter were owned and enslaved by Peter and Elizabeth, Peter's sister, the Russells, as domestics for household duty and to do farm work. Peggy and her children resisted the Russell's demands on different occasions and were punished for, as Elizabeth wrote in her diary about Peggy and her family, <coughs> excuse me, being, quote, insolent, pilfering, and lying, end quote. There is a record showing Peggy and her son Jupiter were once jailed as a form of punishment. Another time, Jupiter was tied up for show in a storehouse window at the age of 13 for punishment and to serve as an example to others. That comes from so much to learn the household stories of slavery in Canada. And again, I have that on my references page, which I um, won't be in the um, PowerPoint slides, unfortunately, 
because I came up with it later, but I'll, I can make reference to it in the question and answer period. What I'd like to do is it's difficult to see the ad that's in front on your PowerPoint slide of the woman on the left of the PowerPoint slide, who is Peggy, wearing the quite um, remarkable hat. And this is an ad that was taken out by Peter Russell. And I, I want to read it to you because it's very difficult to see. This is a, an ad, a Peggy sale advertisement. It reads, to be sold, a black woman named Peggy, aged about 40 years, and a black boy, her son, aged 15 years, both of them the property of the subscriber. The woman is a tolerable cook and washerwoman and perfectly understands making soap and candles. The boy is tall and strong of his age and has been employed in, co in country business but brought up principally as a house servant. They are each of them servants for life. The price for, for the woman is $150. So for the boy, $200, payable in three years with interest from the day of sale, and to be properly secured by bond due. But one fourth less will be taken in ready money. And that's with Peter Russell's name at the end. It was in an advertisement taken out in York on February the 20th, 1806. You'll also see in the slide, of course, um, the, uh, a letter that he wrote, um, Peter Russell to Matthew Elliott uh, in 1801, saying that his slave Peggy was, as we go down a bit, it says troublesome. And he, he was actually inquiring about getting his money back from Matthew Elliott, because it would appear that Matthew Elliott was the one who sold uh, Peggy to him originally. And I'm going to continue. So I wanted to read some of Peggy's life just so that we can make her feel, make um, us feel that the Chloe's and Peggy's are, are more important, indeed more important than the people who had decisions over their lives. Continuing with the, this history story, it's chapter five. Wilderness years of little change for Upper Canada slaves and for Richard Pierpoint. After John Grave Simcoe left Upper Canada in 1796 and with, with William Osgood now in Lower Canada, the latter half, now in Overcast, the latter half of the 1790s, and indeed during the first few years of the 19th century, there was little, if any, political movement towards slavery abolition in Upper Canada. On Simcoe's recommendation before leaving Upper Canada, Peter Russell assumed head administrator role for the provincial government in 1796. He held this position until a successor lieutenant governor, governor was named in 1799. With Robert Isaac de Grey as provincial solicitor general, along with other slave owning members in each governing house, there seemed little chance for imminent change regarding slavery in Upper Canada. Looking back, these could be called the wilderness years for Upper Canada as enslaved. Indeed, as mentioned once before, Christopher Robinson introduced a legislative assembly bill in 1798 to effectively reverse the 1793 act to limit slavery and reaffirm this imperial statute of 1790, if you recall, which allowed slaves to be brought in at the time, slaves to be brought in to Upper Canada. Robinson's bill passed in legislative assembly, but stalled in legislative council. Then it died at end of parliament session. If only there were more stories about lives of Upper Canada's enslaved, then we'd know more about what it was like for them to live during these quote, wilderness years. Remember the estimated number is that 500 to 700 enslaved people lived in 1790s Upper, upper Canada. Though he was no longer a slave by the time he came to what eventually became Upper Canada, Richard Pierpoint's life story is as intriguing as it is surprising. As a member of Butler's Rangers fighting for the British in the American Revolutionary War, Pierpoint came north in 1780 from Virginia, where he had been a slave owned by a British military officer. Pierpoint settled as a Black loyalist on 200 acres of land in the 1780s 
at what is now called Dix Creek in the area of present day St. Catharines. It was homestead granted to him for his wartime service. Then Pierpont first entered the fray of Upper Canada's political system in 1794 when he signed the Petition of Free Negroes, requesting that free blacks who had been British soldiers be granted land adjacent to one another so they could work together clearing land they'd been granted. The petition of free Negroes was presented to Lieutenant Gov Governor Simcoe and the Executive Council on July 8, 1794, when it was dismissed. In retrospect, the impression left by the government's decision denying this group of, quote, freed Blacks their freedom to live together in community so they might share in the arduous work clearing house to house homestead land granted to them is that the governing members felt threatened by the thought of, quote, free Blacks living in close association. Unlike the enslaved Blacks of Upper Canada, who were forced to live in relative isolation under the watchful eyes of their owners. Without the help needed to clear his land, Pierpoint either abandoned or sold his granted homestead and subsequently faded from history for nearly two decades as another of history's selectively forgotten. And then in 1812 came another war with the American neighbors to the south. Though he was 68 years of age, Pierpoint proposed to organize a small black regiment, a corps of men of color, to fight against invading American troops in the Niagara area. Chapter six, the end of slavery in Upper Canada. Oh, sorry. Skip the page. <laughs> Continuing at, with Pierpoint. With his offer to organize his own corps of men of color refused, Pierpoint fought in the War of 1812 with Runchie's Company of Colored Men, a unit that fought in conflicts including the Battle of Queenston Heights and the Battle of Lundy's Lane. Pierpoint and his group were honorably discharged from service in 1815 when he was more than 70 years old. For his recent military service, Pierpoint was once again granted 100 acres of uncleared forest in the Niagara area. However, wishing to return to his West African homeland in Senegal, where he had been taken as a 16 year old in 1860, Pier Pierpoint petitioned Lieut Lieutenant Governor Peregrine Maitland in July 1821 for passage to Africa instead of receiving the land grant. Now, just a, a note about Maitland. Maitland, from what I can find, was the first politician in what are now the colonies which became Canada to bring up the idea of a residential school like school for Indigenous children taking them from their families. Back to Pierpoint. Title this the petition of Richard Pierpoint of the town of Niagara, a man of color, a native of Africa, and an, inhab an inhabitant of this province since the year 1780, Pierpoint's request was denied. In, in July 1822, at the age of 78, Pierpoint was given 100 acres of forest near present day Fergus, depended upon clearing and fencing five acres of land within two years, and also building a small house for living and clearing road in front of the lot. I spent that time talking about Richard Point, Pierpoint, since even though he hadn't been a slave, I feel that he was treated, even though he was, quote, a freed man, in many ways he, would treat, he was treated no better than if he was still a slave in Upper Canada. Chapter six, the end of slavery in Upper Canada by spark and fire on a Caribbean island. Almost 40 years after the incendiary spark caused by Chloe Cooley's shout, no, voiced a cry for freedom while igniting a fire to end slavery in Upper Canada, a similar spark lit flames in Jamaica. On December 27, 1831, fires burned on Jamaican sugar plantations worked on by black slaves for two centuries. 
Like Chloe's shout, no, four decades earlier, one individual more than any other struck the spark against slave labor in Jamaica in late 1831. That person was a literate slave and a Baptist deacon named Samuel Sharp, A.K. Archer, who dreamt of freedom someday for all. Fires for change and an ultimate end to slavery burned long and hot enough that British legislation against slavery in the British Empire followed on August 28, 1833. And slavery officially ended one year later in Upper Canada as it did in all of the British Empire on August 28, 1834. Though credit may go to some of history's political elite, the fires that truly ended slavery in Upper Canada and all the British Empire were sparked by the bravery of the enslaved. And thank you, that's the end of my talk for this evening entitled The Gradual End of Slavery in Upper Canada. Glenn, I wanna thank you very much for a very moving and thoughtful presentation, um, <clears throat> pulling together the information that you're right, we were not taught this in schools. This is not in the textbooks. Uh, this is such an important part of our history. We're gonna encourage people to put any questions they have into the chat room. Uh, one of the questions that came up already, Glenn, and, and um, you may not have the answer to this, but it is certainly a thoughtful question. And I guess we're just wondering if some of the, the protagonists were also owners of enslaved people, even though they were pushing for the end of slavery. I'm not sure if you have the information, but it certainly is an interesting question, isn't it? Um, okay, so that would be, I guess, um, the question would be relating to the protagonists, at least the ones I've, because there would be other protagonists that I haven't named, indeed, um, one would think. Um, these are the ones that are um, the easiest to find, and also the ones that were um, in either the Legislative Assembly or Legislative Council, or perhaps both, and perhaps even in the, uh, the Cabinet, the Executive Council. Yeah. Um, um, the three that are mentioned, um, I, um, I fair, fairly thoroughly um, researched the three of them, and, and I don't believe that any of Simcoe, Osgood, or White owned slaves. Um, I can't speak on behalf of James Monk, who was also on that list on that particular slide, a lower, um, but he was a lower Canada Attorney General and Queen's King's Bench Chief Justice. I included him because of decisions where he refused to send back slaves to Upper Canada, escaped slaves, and Ward Chapman, a lawyer advocating for slave resent. I can't speak as authoritatively on those two, but the first three, um, I'd be willing to bet my last nickel that neither of them did. Um, at least um, it would great, really surprise me, someone, um, even John White who wrote the bill um, with bone slaves. So I'm going to also invite people to ask questions of June Gervin if they wish, and perhaps Glenn, you'd like to uh, share the screen with June yeah, as well. Me over. There may be questions that one or both of you might want to jump in and answer. So I've, I've got one basic question. Uh, so just clarify for us, when did slavery fully end in Lower Canada? Do you know that answer? Um, I believe in effect, even though it wasn't, didn't have legal effect, because remember, Lower Canada was still, was at this point part of the British Empire, right? So legally, it wouldn't have ended until the same time, 1834. Right. But I believe the courts, with Osgood having gone there, I think, I think I read that in, in about the early 18 aughts, that the courts recognized the, the, the um, the slaves as free, but it's still, um, but that's the courts. So le legally, I think in effect, they were still slaves of the owners. And as you pointed out- has, I don't know if June has a, a, anything more on that. As you pointed out before as well, um, Lower Canada did not have the same migration of loyalists who no. at the time were bringing their, their enslaved people with them. And, and the reason for that is the loyalists were, were, were British and English speaking. 
and uh, they were going to either Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, or Upper Canada. Another question is, by the time that slavery ended in 1834, you had mentioned that back in the 1790s, there were as many as 700 enslaved people in Upper Canada. I don't suppose we have an idea of how many remained in 1834. I know that through the grandfather clause, generationally, there probably were a reduced number. Would that be yes, fair to I say? would think there would be, but I don't have a number for that. But yeah, yeah because with the 1793 Act, once someone turned, what was it, I think, believe 25, mm -hmm. that um, if they were born into slavery, they no longer were, um, were uh, slaves to those owners. Yeah. As well, um, the practice was that if an enslaved person escaped, the courts would send them back to their enslaver. Um, but once Osgood started saying that we cannot bring anyone into, into, into the province to be enslaved, then the eventually, and so because the, the enslavers lost the support of the courts, then slavery gradually petered out. So one person is just asking for clarification. And the question is, was the act to limit slavery reversed in the late 1790s. And I think, Glenn, the point was not that it was reversed, but that this act in Simcoe's mind was going to be more all-encompassing and that the act that uh, that emanated, the act to limit slavery, was, was, a, was a weakened compromise. Would that be a correct uh, summary of that? Well, yeah, but if the question is referring to the 1798, that would be the Christopher Robinson um, act that passed, or bill that passed it didn't become an act. It passed in the Legislative Assembly, but, but then had to be passed in Legislative Council. But it stalled there. And then at the end of the parliamentary session, it became, it went off the books. And so the bill never actually made it to an act. But it would have, if it had passed, would have, re would have reversed. Um, and the uh, 1793 Act to limit slavery would have become basically null and void. So as, as I understand it, the 1793 Act to Limit Slavery basically said that there could be no additional enslaved people in Upper Canada. Is that correct? No one could bring anyone. No one could bring. Yeah. Yeah. People could be born into slavery, though. So yeah. you could have been for a period of time, you could have increases because of people being born. So another question is, and it's an interesting one because we, we always compare our situation with comparison in other countries like the United States. When slavery ended in the British Empire, what did the freed people do? And did they receive, compens did they receive fair compensation for the labor afterwards? Uh, were they mobile? Were they able to seek employment elsewhere? Uh, I will speak and then I'm sure June will want something. There's also something else that needs to be considered there. The people who owned the slaves were compensated at the time. And it was, um, I can't put my finger on how much they were receiving, but it was in what I did read, it would be in the millions of dollars by today's money that the owners who, um, what's the term again? Oh, um, I mean, there's a term on the free, the free emancipation. No, no, there's a free, well, it's, 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 but there's a term. There's the freeing of those slaves because of the, because of the 1834 legislation in British Parliament, um, the owners were compensated. Um, not perhaps as much as the owners would want, but they were compensated. Now, as far as money um, to the, the ones who had been enslaved, I'll let June speak to that because I'm not really okay. sure. So um, the act was passed, um, but it actually did not really free the enslaved people in the British Empire um, because it called for, um, um, <laughs> it, it called for four more years of um, labor of um, essentially free labor. And so, for example, the act 
ended in 1834. It should have. It should it should have taken effect in, in 1834, but in places like Jamaica, it didn't actually take, take effect until 1838 um, because the recently freed people had to do an apprenticeship as they were considered to be not really ready for freedom. So they had to be apprenticed to understand what freedom is, which is essentially was just getting another four years of, of, of um, free labor. In fact, those three years, those four years um, were even worse uh, because during slavery, they were, because they were property, then they, they were given some sort of food and some sort of clothing. But once the act uh, came into place and they were in an apprenticeship, they also now had to find their own food and their own clothing. So things got worse. So um, uh, Glenn mentioned the, uh, the um, legacies of British slave labor, the database, uh, which is run by the university, by the um, UCL, university, which, College, uh, university London. College of London and supported by Harvard University. You will find there the persons who got compensation. You'll find for how many people they were compensated. Uh, you will find how much money they got. Um, and in that, you will find persons like Goulburn, for whom our street is named. Uh, you will find, actually, you'll find Sir Johnny MacDonald. Uh, you'll find, so it was only in 2015 that the British government finally paid off the mm -hmm. loans that they took out to pay compensation for the enslavers. Of course, the enslaved got nothing. And so um, in places in the British Empire, like in the Caribbean, uh, the, the enslaved got nothing. They now had to start building a life uh, from scratch. Um, the Caribbean is different from the United States because people did not go from Europe to the Caribbean to homestead or to make a home. They went to make money. Uh, not, not like the United States where there were homesteaders. So when slavery was over after the apprenticeship period was done, then the absentee landlords returned to Britain, Europe, wherever they came from. And, um, and so I say that the workers got a hold of the sugar factory. So when you look at the islands now, the Caribbean islands, um, it's, it's quite remarkable because they've been rebuilt by the enslaved. The, the whole society has had to be rebuilt by people who were enslaved. And so now the question is that many of the mansions in Britain have been built by enslaved people's labor. And so how do we repair that damage? It's very complex. And so Black History Ottawa is doing a project called Black History in Ottawa Streets. So there are streets in Ottawa that carries the history of slavery, like Russell, like Goulburn, and so on. So Peter Stockdale contributes that the word you were probably looking for was manumission? Manumission, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I so, slipped my tongue. <laughs> yeah. Now, in the projects that we worked at together, including the upcoming Island on Fire workshop series, and, and that's being done also in partnership with the Labour Council of Ottawa, because June, you pointed out that there's such a, a, a clear connection between uh, enslavement and other, that it was a labor issue. And, and another question that Peter asks is, if we're able to trace the line between enslaved people from the Caribbean to contemporary Caribbean migrant labor. Well, um, all of us in the Caribbean who are of African descent, um, have a British family name, have a European family name, but we are not members of European families. 
um, and one can un unpack that. Um, we speak a European mother tongue, but we don't have European mothers. One can unpack that as well. Um, because when, when one's body is owned by someone else, that person who, the, who claims ownership to one's body has ownership over all aspects of the body. And for women, it meant having ownership of the womb as well. And so there are many Caribbean people who have a large percent of European DNA. Um, but back in during slavery, when these children were born of enslaved mothers, the children were given the status of the mothers. So the children were born slaves. And so uh, going back to the Chloe Cooley story, uh, you'll see that Peter Martin's children and grandchildren were given as gifts to to the grandson of uh, to the grandson John of John Butler, yeah. and so the, there was no family. Um, you, you, you can imagine that people, human beings, were being treated like cattle. Uh, they were being bred, and so on. So up until the abolition of the slave trade, which was 1808. Um, the persons who came off the ship um, were the fittest because most of the unfit had died. And uh, so the ones who came off the ship uh, were the, the, the laborers, but their life expectancy was not very long because they were worked to death, but they could always buy some more off the ships. After, slave, after the slave trade was abolished and they could not buy new enslaved people off the ships, then it became important to create uh, homegrown ones. And this is when the women's wombs, you know, it was, yeah, um, the women's wombs became way more important because now they had to uh, produce their own. And so there were girls at 12 years old who was being referred to as breeding wenches. And the older women were belly women. Um, these are things that we don't actually talk about. Um, but you know, when you look at one human being actually claiming ownership over the body of another human being and being treated like a machine. So I say like a machine because we often hear that Henry Goulburn was concerned about his enslaved people in Jamaica. He, by the way, was an absentee landlord. Um, and when you hear that he was being he was concerned, you think of him as a kind enslaver. But in fact, the concern was just about his property. He wanted to make sure that they ate enough so that they could work hard enough. If I may add to uh, June alluded to this, is that not just the bodies were owned by the enslavers, but the names were owned by the enslavers. For example. Um, Richard Pierpoint, that name was the name of his, uh, the British officer who owned him when he first was brought over from Bandu, which was in West Africa, which is now Senegal, the country of Senegal, in 1860 as a 16-year-old. He worked for him and then was freed when he, um, he was allowed to go free to work, uh, to, to um, be part of the British um, uh, military, um, or at least uh, serve in the, in the military, um, whether it was a soldier or had someone to help soldiers um, uh, in, in the, the American Revolutionary War. And then, of course, even Samuel Sharp was the name of his enslaver. Mm -hmm. And so these names, which June alluded to, 
um, these European names were the names it's it's I liken it to um, since she brought up the terms cattle to branding you, um, they were branded with the names of their owners. Well, they were branded with the names of the owners, but they were also literally branded. And and so um, what you see is <laughs> it's it's not about Europeans. For me, it's not about Europeans and Africans. It's about man's hum inhumanity to man. And you know. it's it, it's it's really we we can talk about it as slavery, but the African people were simply available um, for use, available to be captured, available to be transported. Um, from my reading of history, it's not about Europeans and Africans. It's simply about capitalism. And, um, and, and, and essentially cruelty. You know, the, the capacity for for humans to be that cruel. And then of course, after slavery was abolished um, and the free labor and cheap labor was not available anymore, then that's when the social construct of race um, came into play because you had to keep the caste system going. And so it really is a caste system so that persons with a certain color of skin um, could be used in a certain way. And so we get to the issue of what is white. So one drop of African, the, 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 the rules of the game is one drop of African blood made you black. And the question is, where did the 99 drops come from? From whom did they come? And so you see, uh, for most people, in, in for I don't know if most, but for many, many people uh, who have an ancestry in slavery, they also have ancestry in Europe and the slave owners. And that's one of the things that we don't talk about. So for example, many of the street names in Ottawa that are British are also the names of streets in Jamaica or the Caribbean that are British. Not only that, but a lot of the names are family names of, are the most common family names of Caribbean people. So the name Russell is very common in the Caribbean. The name Goulburn is very common and so on. So we share a lot in, the, you know, just take it Ottawa and the Caribbean, we share a lot because we share a history. And so this is where, you know, when you're talking about people enslaved, um, there is no such thing as black history without white history. You know, we, we, it's human nature to judge, to judge others. We don't like to judge ourselves. Um, it, when people think about enslaved people, we probably most often think about the Caribbean or we think about south of the border. We don't think about Canada. We don't think about Upper Canada. And when we think about these things, we like to judge those from the past. We like to think that the past is the past, 1833 happened. But when we look, we see that there's this long echo from 1833. Whether it's labor, temporary laborers, what we still get from the Caribbean, whether it's the railway porters, whether it's the United States still having issues of civil rights 100 years after slavery was abolished there. Um, uh, the echo continues into the into the present time, doesn't it? I would yes, and, and to uh, segue off of that, bringing it back to my talk and why I subtitled "Narrative Myths Believed as Historical Truths." I really think there needs to be um, an adjustment somehow to curricula that is that are that's taught, especially in high schools, history classes, because. I, I would like to know how many history students over the past generations, and even now, um, have even an inkling of the history slavery that uh, we have in this province, um, the early days of this province. 
because it, because indeed I know I never was taught that but then again I was never taught about res residential schools either you see my age I was born in the early 50s and so I went to school I started high school I believe in 1967 and I, I never learned about residential schools in high school history classes and I took you know even though I had ended up taking English in university and so on I was very keen on history in high school I never learned about the fact that I learned that we were can we were basically Canada the good. We took we were the terminus for escaping slaves, and we would take them into our we took them into our bosom, and they were freed. Well, I gave the one example in my pre preface of a woman who escaped in the early 1800s. She died, and the reason I I don't know when she as I couldn't find when she came to Upper Canada from New York City, but she escaped in, from New York City. And it ended up being enslaved, bought for $100 by this man by the name of, I think it was Hat, I can't remember now, um, and in Dundas, Hamilton. And um, she died in about, apparently, about 1855. And she was born in, I believe, 1777. So she would have escaped and come up in the early 1800s. And somehow, whether it happened before she crossed the border, she was caught, but then sold to somebody in. And this would have, um, one would think, but I don't know when, even perhaps before, um, uh, before Simcoe became Lieutenant Governor. I'm not mm -hmm. sure the exact date, but she was sold, spent seven years, and then ended up living, living in Queens Bush, which is um, a, a black settlement where freed slaves end up living. Mm -hmm. Well, um, sitting with us, with Glenn and me uh, here is Jean-Marie from Black History Ottawa. Uh, Jean-Marie is from Haiti. And the, the story of Haiti is also one that is not well known. Jean-Marie, would you come on up? We can see your face. <laughs> yeah, and, and, <laughs> and well, John Marie's coming over. I wanted to, I was going to at the beginning, but I'll say it now. I want to thank both Jean Marie and Ruth, who are both who are both with Black History Ottawa, who were my technical support. I work with words. I'm not much of, of a techie. And he's been was a great help with the PowerPoint slide. And of course, my final thank you is is for my mentor, June, who introduced me to Chloe in the beginning. Okay, Jean Marie. So the story of one over John Marie. I'll sit in the back. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the story of the Haitian yes. Revolution mm -hmm. and uh, what the Haitian Revolution um, cost the Haitian people economically. And um, when Haiti finally paid off France, it's a whole other story. Um, and Jean Marie is from Haiti. So just wanted to say next time, maybe we can talk about Haiti uh, because there's a reason why Haiti. Um, as you know, the first, um, the biggest revolution of enslaved people and how it's come to that today. Yes, I won't say much about that, uh, more about that. Uh, like you said, perhaps we'll keep that for another uh, presentation. Uh, ben, more work on your plate. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yes, it's just to say that, yeah, Haiti had to pay uh, essentially France over several years. Decades. Yeah, uh, decades. Uh, what they thought they would have been getting as the yearly revenue uh, from slavery. So because Haiti uh, had a successful revolution, slavery didn't exist anymore. So every year they had to pay France. I don't I have the, the amount right, right mm -hmm. here with me, but... Yeah, they have to pay that, and I believe the amount was, it was until the mid-90s that they finished paying that, 1990s. Well, thank you, Jean-Marie, and I, I know our hearts go out to the people of Haiti because good fortune does not seem to come to those to that island. Uh, there's been so, so much tragedy and, 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 and everything going on there. Um, June and Glenn, do you have any last words before we wrap up this evening? Just wondering if there are any more questions. No, I think you've, you've you've resolved most of our questions for us. 
So I would really like to thank you both and as well, Ruth and Jean-Marie for their assistance and Black History Ottawa for partnering on this. I think it's been a very important story to tell and Glenn, thank you for telling it so well. Um, please everybody join us in a month when we'll have Mike McBain talking about Bytown 1847, that'll be right here on Zoom. And again, please join us in two weeks at the auditorium when we'll have Phil Rossi talking about the history of the Kiwanis Club, as well as Sam LaPrade taking us back three years to those first three months of COVID and everything went through. So thank you very much for uh, Ben presentation. Sorry. Everybody. Uh, sorry, you did ask if I had anything to say and I didn't oh, think of I it right known. away. I should have known. But however, I, I really do want to I just want to give you my heartfelt thanks for being Ben. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and your team, your team. It's, it's extraordinary to me that you have embraced our history in the way that you have. And just to say to those persons who are on the call that this year we are marking these anniversaries and Black History Ottawa um, don't want to come up with an idea and say, this is what we're going to do to mark the anniversaries. These community conversations that you're hosting, Ben, um, engaging people who are part of the collective, you might even call it the John Grave Simcoe Collective or the Chloe Cooley Collective. Um, if we can think of ways in which we can um, have community celebrations of the things that we need to celebrate because there are many things. Um, and, um, and look at the kind of legacy that we have received and the kind of legacy that we want to pass on. Black History Ottawa's theme for the year is legacies worth preserving, legacies worth celebrating, and legacies worth creating. And um, with you in the lead, as you've taken such a magnificent lead, um, we do want to look at what are these legacies? And, and we talk a lot about racism. What we don't talk about is persons like yourself and Glenn and their team who um, are really humanitarians. And it's not about race. We're all of one human race. And the theme of the work then that you are doing, um, we agreed, is with an Ubuntu sensibility. Ubuntu meaning that our humanity are interlocked with one another's. And so all the things that we're doing is Ubuntu inspired and safe space. Uh, because we want to have conversations where we can all just open up and tell our truth and speak our truth and sometimes really mess up by, by using the wrong terminology. Um, but we're all in this together and we have to learn together a tone where atonement needs to happen, reconciliation where reconciliation needs to happen and go forth together as a community. So thank you for the amazing role you're playing in that. Thank you for the, for this, to the society, for all that you are in Ottawa. Thanks. And thanks. Thank you, June. And thank Richard and Lynn and Jacob who back us up as well. And have a good night, everybody. <laughs>